We may be at a pivotal turning point. Human beings have only been here for about 175,000 years. We're the youngsters. But I suspect that we may be seeing the potential extinction of our species sometime in the next century. It's difficult to say that, but I'm going to share a little statistic with you and you make the judgment call. The real economy is photosynthesis. The sun's energy bays the earth. We pick up photosynthesis in our plants and all the rest of economic activity for our fellow creatures and our species is all dependent on that bottom line. We human beings are less than 1% of the entire entire biomass of the earth. We're now using 24% of all the photosynthesis. It takes my breath away. We have become monsters. This just isn't sustainable. We have to change. You remember in July 2008, price of oil went up to $147. Inflation soared. Basic items, including groceries at the food store, petrol for your car, virtually all the construction material, all of our pharmaceutical products, most of our clothes, uh, transportation, our power, our heat, our light, our logistics, our supply chain, it's all made out of carbon deposits. When prices hit $147, $7 a barrel, the engine turned off. That was the meltdown. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. Right now, the economy is starting to grow, but what's happening? Oil is going over $80 a barrel again. You tell me how we get through that wall of $147. This is an end game. We are there. Fast forward, December 2009, Copenhagen. World leaders from 192 countries come together to address the spent CO2 from two centuries of using fossil fuels. My wife says we're not grasping the enormity of this moment. The frame of this seems too big to comprehend, so we're either in denial or business as usual. I believe that the problem lies deeper than just the inability to come up with a new global mechanism to regulate a global economy. My sense is the problem lies with the fact that we are continuing to rely on 18th and 19th century ideas about human nature and the human journey that were spawned at the beginning of the market era, the nation state era, where 1500 years the church had the last say about human nature. The little baby is born in sin to pray and if we want salvation we have to wait for Christ and of story. The Enlightenment philosophers took on that worldview, John Locke, the great political philosopher of the Enlightenment, said, look, babies are born tabula rasa, blank slate. He said, however, there is a predisposition to acquire property. Somebody should have caught him on that. Adam Smith, the great Scottish economist of the Enlightenment, said, our little babies do have an inclination for moral sentiment. But he said, our key nature is we're born with a drive to be autonomous and to pursue our material self-interest in the market. The very basis of classical economic theory. Later in the 19th century, Jeremy Bentham said, little babies are actually born with a desire to have pleasure and to avoid pain and we are driven by utilitarian desire. Charles Darwin said every organism, their drive is to secure their survival by reproducing themselves. Sigmund Freud said, actually little babies are born with an insatiable sexual appetite and want to extinguish their libido. Is that what it's all about? Our little babies? And mom and dad look, looked in their eyes, is that what we were seeing? Evil, depraved, rational, calculating, detached, autonomous, self-interested, driven by materialism, utilitarian to the core, and seeking to extinguish their libido. If that truly is our human nature, I suspect we're doomed. But there is another frame of reference emerging in the sciences, which is quite interesting. It really challenges these assumptions. And with that, the institutions that we have created, our educational institutions, our business practices, our governing institutions, etc. Let me take you back to the early 1990s. Scientists had a MRI on a macaque monkey. So the monkey's trying to open up the nut, the neurons light up and just by serendipity a human being walked in the lab and he was hungry he saw the nuts and opened up one of the nuts and tried to crack it open the macaque monkey didn't move he just gazed at this human trying to open up the nut the same exact neurons were lighting up when he observed the human being opening the nut as when the monkey opened the nut they then began to put MRIs on other primates then they went to humans and what they found is something called mirror neurons and that is that we are apparently soft wired with mirror neurons so that if I'm observing you your anger your frustration your sense of rejection your joy. I can feel what you're doing. The same neurons will light up in me as if I'm having that experience myself. This isn't all that unusual. We know if you puncture yourself and blood comes out, I'm going to feel that. You're actually soft wired to experience another's plight as if we were experiencing ourselves. Mirror neurons are just the beginning of a whole range of research going on in neuropsychology, brain research, and in child development that suggests that we are actually soft wired for sociability, attachment, affection, companionship, and that the first drive is the drive to actually belong. It's an empathic drive. What is empathy? Very complicated. When little babies are in a nursery and one baby cries, the other babies will cry in response. They just don't know why. Once a toddler can identify themselves, then they know that if they're observing someone else have a feeling, they know that if they feel something, it's it's because they're feeling it because someone else has it. You follow me? They're two separate beings. Selfhood goes together with empathic development. Increasing selfhood, increasing empathic development. So when a child learns that life is vulnerable and fragile, that every moment is precious, and that they have their own unique history, it allows a the child then to experience another's plight 
fight in the same way. So if you think about the times that we've empathized with each other or fellow creatures, it's always because we felt their struggle to be and to flourish, and we show solidarity with our compassion. Empathy is the opposite of utopia. There's no empathy in utopia because there is no suffering. So when we talk about building an empathic civilization, we're not talking about utopia. We're talking about the ability of human beings to show solidarity, not only with each other, but our fellow creatures who have a one and only life on this little planet. We are homo empathicus, so here's the question. We know that consciousness changes in history. The way our brain is wired today is not the way a medieval surf brain would be wired. So the question I asked at the beginning of this study is, how does consciousness change in history? The historians were not of much help to me because the historians chronicle pathology, the Holocaust, the genocide, the blowbacks, the colonization, the wars, the exploitation, the redress of grievances. Why? They're newsworthy because they're not what we ordinarily know every day. But then when you chronicle all of history with the pathological moments, we get a pretty dim vision of the human race. George Frederick Hegel said happiness are the blank pages of history. Historians don't write about them. But if we were pathological the way the story had said, we would have perished a long time ago. We'd be so monstrous. When we create more complex energy regimes that allow us to bring more diverse people together in more complex civilizations, it requires a second thing, a communication revolution to manage these new energy regimes. These convergences of communication energy are very interesting because the communication revolution not only organizes the energy, it changes the mind, it changes consciousness, fundamentally. Empathy is what allows us to stretch our sensibility with another so that we can cohere in larger social units. To empathize is to civilize, to civilize is to empathize. And this is, doesn't happen in some kind of a beautifully linear way. There are blowbacks, and many times the blowbacks happen at the end of one civilization and the beginning of the other, when new identities put in doubt the old identities and the xenophobism kicks back with a vengeance. But if we have gone from empathy in blood ties to empathy in, in religious associational ties to empathy based on national identification, is it really a big stretch to imagine the new technologies allowing us to connect our empathy to the human race writ large in a single biosphere? And what reason would we stop here at the nation-state identity and only have ideological empathy or theological-based empathy or tribal-based blood ties? There is a deep paradox to history. As we create increasingly more complex energy-consuming civilizations, they certainly create a more cosmopolitan attitude. They certainly bring more people together, stretch consciousness, stretch empathy, but the expense of entropy. It's really an empathy-entropy paradox. Today, we're in a globally connected world. Our youngsters can begin to empathize across all the traditional lines. In the last 50 years, imagine how empathy has extended. Women, the disabled, those of different sexual preferences, the people of color, minorities. And now, to our fellow creatures, we're beginning who recognize as having rights and recognition in law. This has all happened very quickly in terms of the long history of empathy. We almost can grasp the possibility of global empathy, but I think we also can grasp that we may be at the moment of extinction. It is a bittersweet irony, the empathy entropy paradox. How do we break it? We are on the cusp of a new energy communication convergence. We had a very impressive communication revolution the last 10 years. This second generation communication is very different than first generation. That was top down. Telegraph, telephone, cinema, radio, television, centralized. The new communication, the ICT revolution, is open source, flat, peer to peer. And here's the key word it's distributed. It's distributed. Meaning two billion people can put a little utensil in their hand and they can send their own video, audio, and text to all the other two billion people at the same time, at the speed of light, with more power than the centralized BBC, and we did it all in 15 years. What I want to suggest to you is that this distributed communication revolution is just now converging with a new energy regime, distributed energy. What are distributed energies? Let's compare them to elite energy. Fossil fuels, the first and second industrial revolution, are the most elite centralized energy infrastructure we've ever created. They're elite because they're only found in certain places, they require huge Huge military investments to secure them, huge geopolitical investments to manage them, massive capital flows to organize them. Those energies are sunsetting. The infrastructure based on them has been on life support since July 2008. It is not coming back. It is not coming back. Not coming back. What are distributed energies? Go home tonight. You have all the energy you need in the backyard. Wind flows across, blows across this world every day. The sun shines on this planet. We all have heat under the ground. Wherever there's water, you have small hydroelectricity. We have agricultural and forestry waste in the rural areas and the ocean tides coming in and out every day. These are distributed energy. How do we collect all this renewable energy? The first idea is, oh, let's go where the sun is, the Mediterranean, harness the sun and ship it across Europe. Or let's find the wind off Ireland, harness the wind, centralize it, and ship it back. I do not oppose centralization. 
decentralized solar and wind, but that's not 21st century thinking. If renewable energies are distributed and found in virtually every square foot of this world, why would we only collect them in a few central points? The vision in the third industrial revolution rollout is every single existing building in every home, office, factory, shopping center converted to a partial power plant so it can collect the distributed energy around the building, the sun, the wind, the heat under the ground, etc. We have buildings up now in Spain, Puerto Puig and Paris. They actually produce more power than we knew just from the local energy around them. How do we store renewable energy? Because the sun isn't always shining, the wind isn't always blowing. So let's say the sun's hitting your roof, generate a little electricity. You have some surplus, electrolyzed water, high school chemistry. We had the anode, the cathode, we slipped it in the water, and the hydrogen comes out and you put it in a tank. Hydrogen storage technology to store these energy. We also like other storage, batteries, flywheels, capacitors, water pumping, whatever works. And then when you need the electricity because the sun isn't shining, convert it back to electricity. Yes, there's a energy loss. The second law of thermodynamics. Whenever you convert energy, you lose energy. Entropy is the unavailable energy. You never break even. You always lose. And if we understood the amount of conversion loss of bringing uranium to the nuclear power plant or coal to your house, it's through the roof compared to what I've just talked about. We use the same exact technology that created the internet. We take the power grid and transform it to an intergrid that acts like the internet. When millions of buildings are producing just a little bit of their own energy, storing it with hydrogen like you store digital and media, and then what they don't need, sharing across Europe with distributed IT, the actual power exceeds anything you could imagine with centralized nuclear and coal-fired power plants. And everyone under the age of 30 that grew up on file sharing knows exactly what I'm talking about. We called it cheating, file sharing. The music companies did not see the power of distributed music, and the music companies collapsed within six years. The newspapers did not see the blogospheres coming, and the newspapers are now in trouble. Microsoft did not see Linux coming. Distributed power won't work on the commons, not a chance. Encyclopedia Britannica didn't see Wikipedia coming. We're now talking about distributed power. For a generation that grew up with the idea of producing your own information and sharing it, why shouldn't the next generation grow up with the idea of generating their own energy and be responsible for sharing it across time? This gives us distributed consciousness, maybe biosphere consciousness, because when all of us take responsibility for that small swath of the biosphere where we're husbandering the photosynthesis and then we share it with our neighbors across continents, we become aware of our responsibility to the biosphere. The kids in first grade are learning that everything they do, the clothes they wear, the food they eat, the electricity they use, the car the family drives, all of that impacts some other human being or some other creature somewhere else in the biosphere because we're all connected. That's a revolution. We have the technology that allows us to extend the central nervous system and to think viscerally as a family. When I first saw the video after the Iran elections and the young people took to the streets because of the flawed election, you recall that one young woman was shot down and a friend had taken was taking a video on a cell phone as she was shot down by the government. Within four hours, an entire generation around the world knew her name, her family, her Facebook. It was visceral. We could see it right there. We are extending the central nervous system to connect the human race. It's not going to give us utopia. It's not going to eliminate the fragilities and the inconsistencies and the imperfections and the struggle of being alive. But it will give us a sense of our stewardship of this planet. People say, well, how do we do this in time? I don't know if there's enough time. The only thing I know for sure is we didn't need the scientists to tell us about everything. We know at the end of our life, when we look back, we don't look back on our life and we don't say, gee, that moment where I made a new deal, I felt really impregnable as an island to myself. I felt really detached and rational and really objective. I was able to extinguish my libido and enjoy my utility. There may be some pathological person that does that, but when we look back at our life, we look back and it's the moments where we had that empathic connection, where we transcended ourselves and could actually feel a loved one or someone else as if we were experiencing ourselves. We feel super alive. It's one of those moments where we actually feel transcendence. You don't have to be religious. And we felt we're connected to this mystery called life because we show solidarity with all of it and it makes us feel alive to be in solidarity with someone else's struggle to be. That would make a darn good civilization if all of us felt that way. When the uh, astronauts took their last Apollo mission across the dark side of the moon, and our boys came out on the bright side, and the sun was shining on the Earth in all of its color. They snapped a few photos showing the Earth from outer space in all of its fragility, its beauty, its majesty, and that was an out-of-body experience. Everyone under 30 has this every day with Google Maps today. The new energy communication changes consciousness. Now as we move to a biosphere and a global economy, we have to rethink the human narrative, rethinking human nature, to bring out our empathic sociability so that we can rethink the institutions of society and prepare the groundwork for an empathic civilization. If we can do that, we may have enough time before we face extinction. I think the jury is out. It'll be up to us, and especially the young people here, to make sure this discussion happens. Thank you.